Hello everyone, welcome to another video. My name is Philip, also known as PS RPS and App. Today we are doing PS Does Book Reviews, talking about this book, uh, William Gibson's Burning Chrome. It's gonna be about cyberpunk, which is a subgenre of science fiction. If you're not into cyberpunk, this might not be very interesting for you. It's gonna be a pretty long book since I'm gonna be talking about all 10 of the short stories contained within. So let's get started. I want to try to do this in one take, so I hope I don't mess up too much. Um, why did I get this book? Uh, I was looking to read into the Sprawl series, which contains Mona Lisa Overdrive and Neuromancer and another one that I forget the name, Count Zero, I think it's called. And um, I was uh, checking out, I have only ever read Neuromancer from William Gibson, which I loved. So I was thinking, oh, I should read the whole series. I should start from the beginning. So I checked out the Sprawl series and it says that Burning Chrome... One of the stories in uh, the self-titled uh, book, uh, Burning Chrome, uh, was the precursor of the entire Sprawl series. So Burning Chrome is Sprawl number zero, let's call it that. And then uh, there's Sprawl series number one and Sprawl series number two. Uh, I want to I say that... I want to say that Mona Lisa Overdrive is the one, and Nero Monster is the two, and Count Zero is the three, but I'm really not sure, so probably don't hold me against that. Anyways, I really like this book. Uh, it's mentioned that uh, William Gibson uh, really revolutionized science fiction. He coined the term uh, cyberpunk. Cyberpunk as we know it today exists because of this. Um, and it's totally true, before the Willem Gibson came around, there were some people messing around with technology, um, writing about technology, imagining how technology would affect our world, but this guy really, really uh, took it to the next level, and his way of writing uh, really helps you get inside the story and focus on the story and not as much the technical regards which which is what I really like. I don't like technology just for the sake of having technology. And they still make a lot of movies and stuff like that. Like that you just make a movie about an AI. And uh, seems that they focus more on the AI itself than the whole um, storyline behind it. Like the point of why the philosophical uh, approach of why they are behaving like they are behaving. Anyways, just a little silly example, don't mind me. Let's move on. Um, there's a, a preface by Bruce Sterling, which was pretty good. Uh, I usually don't read prefaces, but since this was by Bruce Sterling, I had to read. Uh, Bruce Sterling is a very famous author of the internet. Uh, the first story is uh, Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, I had already seen the movie, so it didn't really surprise me that much. I think the story is pre pretty faithful to the movie. I don't remember the movie completely, especially the ending. I'm not. I, I think it's not quite the same as as in the story here. But the characters are pretty believable, especially like the aquatic being that shows up. Uh, in the middle, the whole lore behind it, why he's like that. Uh, I, I really like that that small detail. And he has a lot of small details like that, William Gibson. And in fact, I would even venture to say that Johnny Mnemonic has too many of those details. It makes the world a bit less believable, like it puts too much uh, technological jargon in front of you that you kind of get lost and start thinking, that okay, this guy's just... Uh, uh, boasting or making stuff up to appear, make it appear more, more uh, weird, different, uh, conceptual, whatever uh, adjective you want to put on it. But uh, he really just wants to build a believable uh, world. I mean, uh, this topic for touristic urban uh, uh, society, and uh, it has a lot of uh, relations to the the Sprawl series, the the story in particular, Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, but it also, at the same point, does not completely. Anyways, I liked it. I thought it was uh, pretty good. Uh, pretty faithful also to the movie. Have to recommend it. 5 out of 5. <coughs> well, maybe 4 out of 5. The, the writing was a little bit hard to get into if you are if you are not used to cyberpunk yarkon, I think. Uh, the Urns Back Continuum was also pretty interesting. Uh, the Urns Back Continuum is the story of... Uh, a photographer, I believe, um, 
who tries to capture other people's vision and it does like this whole parallel with psychedelic drugs and getting into the zone to capture the perfect artistic moment um, which in the future can be twisted into something that is um, non-organically fabricated so it can be chemically induced um, and I, I, I like the whole thing I like the way that the story was written how it was presented and uh, what it made you reflect about uh, the different ways of getting into uh, different ways of thought it's also very interesting to see the parallel with uh, the art of reading itself because reading if you think about it it's transporting yourself into this specific world and then trying to get something out of that. In our case, it's a story. In the case of this uh, story itself, was to capture a photographic moment to then be able to deliver to, to a client. So I really like that parallel. I think it was very interesting to read. Um, four out of five, uh, probably. Um, yeah. Moving on. Fragments of a hologram rose. I don't really remember much. This is one of the weaker uh, stories from the whole uh, book, in my humble opinion. Um, it's got something to do with refugees and high-tech stuff, uh, holography, but I don't really remember the story anymore, so it didn't really tell me much. I might reread it at some point because it's quite short, it's only seven pages long. Uh, the Belonging Kind, uh, collaboration with John Shirley and William Gibson. I really like this one. A very interesting plot twist. Um... I really, really liked it because it focuses on um, not just the... It starts... It seems that it's starting to focus on uh, the urban way of life of a particular person. And then you start, think, you start thinking that maybe the person is going crazy. But then uh, there's a plot twist, spoiler alert... Uh, that is revealed that it actually things are just different than what we were uh, understanding from the book, and we start uh, reimagining the whole storyline in uh, in in the hands or in the role of of that character, which uh, no longer feels completely human, feels more uh, alien. <laughs> Excuse me, still a little bit sick. Uh, so, it's not completely alien, maybe it's like an evolution of the human life form or evolution of bionics. Um, I'm not quite sure what it can be, uh, actually, but uh, that's never clearly explained uh, in the story that I remember. So, uh, it's, interesting, it's interesting to reflect upon uh, how there are these uh, beings that try to fit in and follow up this ritual of the urban nightlife where in fact they don't really you don't really pay attention to them that much you see them there and they're part of the scenery but they have like ulterior motives behind them so I really like the story for those kind of reflection that it brought Hinterlands Hinterlands was also, also pretty interesting uh, reminded me a lot of um, Another book that I have read, which I, of course, don't remember the name right now. But it was about um, the singularity. And this one has sort of glimpses of singularity from what I understood. Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell a little bit of the plot. Uh, at some point, someone realizes that if you go to space in a certain zone, you come back... Uh, aged, dying, maybe crazy, or dead already, bringing an artifact from another different location, age, dimension, that will incredibly benefit uh, research back on Earth. So a lot of people tried to go there and, you know, uh, bring back something, um, explore, go where no man, other man has gone before. And there are some people who uh, don't qualify for going, uh, but sit around and try to pick off uh, leftovers. And eventually they will have to go there as well. Um, I'm not quite sure on the role that they had on this particular, uh, of these particular uh, characters. I sort of forgot about that part. But um, 
was it really interesting the dynamic on how they use the dynamic the dynamic of the characters to explain the whole story of uh, of this singularity phenomenon that seems to give back things and how that affect human culture itself if singularity would happen tomorrow how how would that change our lives in a practical manner so a lot of food for thought on, on that regard um so yeah, I really liked Interlands. Uh, Red Star Winter Orbit was one of the most fascinating ones. It's uh, written as a co-op with Bruce Sterling. Um, it's about space race, pretty much. Um, space race uh, gone different somehow. Um, the, um, the Russians have a satellite. A very big satellite that they used to colonize space. Uh, the other nations of the world sort of care about it, sort of don't. They have their own projects. And it seems that it's dying out because of corruption in the Russian Empire or whatever. And uh, there were some very interesting characters living inside that, um, that place. And um, some events will unfold that will try to um, uh, sustain or destroy that, uh, that place. And I will not mention anything else to avoid uh, any proper spoilers. I really liked how they uh, focused on the whole space race thing. And this was written in the 80s, probably. So uh, it was very actual with the actual space race that was going. Like, um, first first uh, nation to the moon, first nation to, you know, whatever. Um, first nation to Mars. Um which kind of died out afterwards. I mean, uh, there are still some space operations going on, but they seemed always so hard to finance. It seemed like we had a bit of a slowdown in, in terms of space race, which uh, at the time was pretty much dominated between Russia versus America. And uh, it was a nice take on it. I, I really liked, I enjoyed reading. Um, it was very funny, uh, well written. And you could tell that it was a collaboration, like you tell that we, this isn't William Gibson's writing style. This is slightly different, and uh, that's probably Bruce Sterling's uh, hand in there. Uh, New Rose Hotel was also a pretty good story, not as good as the other stuff. Um, I liked all the massive corporativism, cor cor corporate, corporativism, corporativism, I think, I don't know. Um, that cor corporations are taking over the world and they become uh, the big powers uh, even stronger than uh, um, state uh, than countries themselves than state agencies so if you see a lot of cyberpunk stuff um, and this is also pretty much uh, patent on the the sprawl series from from what I've seen on at least the the games derived from the Sprawl series and stuff like that. Where there's like this big corporation that controls everything, does his own research, um, doesn't abide anyone's laws. Um, and everyone that is a, a, re a senior researcher there is quite valuable for different reasons. And um, human trafficking comes into play, uh, assassinations and stuff like that. Um, because the, the power is everything for these people, the, for these big corporations, and they, they don't answer to anyone. They have the control to subdue whatever whatever law enforcement uh, throws at them. Um, so this this story covers a bit of that uh, ideology. You can see where it started to come from that then shaped up into the Sprawl series. Um, and uh, it tells you the story on the point of view of three different characters, which is also pretty interesting to to check. I enjoyed that. I thought the ending could be a bit better, but overall I, I, I like the story. The Winter Market. The Winter Market, I have to confirm what it is. I read it today, so I shouldn't know it. Oh yeah, it's a story about lease. Um, Winter Market was also pretty good. I really enjoyed it. Um, what can I say about it? Um, 
it also has that um, new urban uh, mythos of enhancing your body or um, allowing your your mind is the only thing that stays alive uh, and your body can um, be replaced by machines exoskeletons that hold you in this case um, mix of uh, drugs with technology um, and it's pretty much the vision of a, of a broken artist there's this new art form which is uh, collecting people's dreams and some people have a more natural talent to do those kind of dreams that get collected than others and apparently it took a very weird character for for to do like a very big hit of of uh or dream capturing and this follows that story it's a bit of a tragic story but it also makes you reflect so it's very introspective at the same time um and I really enjoyed it. I saw like a lot of parallel between uh, what used to be like uh, the pop music star that's like uh, killing themselves on drugs despite being extremely uh, successful. Um, I saw that parallel to this artist here that that she just fades away because um, she she can't take the pain anymore. There's a nice uh, plot twist. Um, halfway through where she uploads her consciousness into uh, a program which uh, is something that really spoke a lot to me um, earlier on in my life that was something that I think that I thought um, made complete sense that would be like the future for everyone everyone would be able to just download their mind into an executable program that based on their memories would be able to keep thinking and keep living and that would be the extension that would be transhumanism uh, itself you would live on forever by uh, transforming your mind into a program software an algorithm even a very advanced neural network uh, of course there are some restraints to that uh, and then there were a lot of uh, questions of, uh, is it still that person? Like, if you have a, how do you distinguish that person from the real person? Um, is it lawful to have more than one instance of that person? Okay, is it lawful to use those softwares for applications other than what the person originally uh, wanted uh, himself or themselves to be used or their brains to be used for like um, what if you use like a person's uh, consciousness uh, algorithm to do like uh, I don't know check if something is pornographic or not I mean you're technically abusing that person's mind or an instance of that person's mind so is it ethical to do that kind of stuff so these questions were were very interesting for me when I was uh, growing up and and uh, uh, taking my degree in, in informatics and uh, artificial intelligence stuff that I was always very interested in. But it's really hard to do a proper brain dump of your of your thing. I mean, um, of your head. You can uh, you can notice the synapses moving, but it's really hard to go to the pinpoint and translate those uh, mappings into actual thoughts, actual memories. Uh, that those are very hard to map and well you pretty much need to get into neurosciences to get into that and it's still very uh, abstract field so i kind of gave up on that dream of ever doing any advances in that field but it's still a topic that fascinates me to this day so yeah i like the story winter market it was definitely very interesting to read uh dog fight uh, collaboration with michael swanwick this one's pretty cool so it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty much um, the story of a... Uh, well, spoiler alert. Uh, it's pretty much the story of a thief who is marked for being a thief. It's pathological thief, maybe because of um, circumstances. Maybe it was society that led him to thieving. We don't really know. But he keeps robbing as a means to stay alive. And he wants to prove that he can be someone. That's his main goal, as far as I could understand. 
And he sees these two guys flying uh, what thought to me were like augmented reality dogfights. Dogfights in the sense that they are planes fighting each other. Uh, not actual dogs. So these uh, plane fights, dog fights, uh, they have like a whole competition of their own and you can control your planes with the power of your mind. You have this special mechanism to do the interface with, uh, with the simulated world. And you respond and if you have faster reactions, you play better. And you also have to think smarter, all those kind of things that make competitive gameplay nowadays. So it's pretty much um, an eSports that was actually uh, at the time, but uh, not virtual. They had, people actually got into saloons and you could see the projection holographic all over the saloon. That's how I, ma how I imagined how it was written here. So that was a very interesting take because we don't really have that advanced holography yet in nowadays in 2020 but at the time gibson was uh, expecting that that would be completely common and makes sense it should be uh, common we have a lot of things that are fake holography uh, reduced size but not something that like can like take over the whole room while people are uh, while people are inside the room and clearly see airplanes flying around you and through you and stuff like that so yeah, interesting to read about it. Um, it's also a very interesting uh, relationship that he has with a student that helps him out um, getting better uh, at his uh, dogfighting skills because he starts off uh, crap. Well, he didn't have a gear. He had to steal his gear. He still was too slow. But the student realized uh, that it uh, could easily be enhanced and give him just a little bit of an edge that would be good enough to beat most uh, everyone else who was falling behind. Uh, it got a bit greedy and things happen in the end. There's some sort of a moral story happening there. Uh, I don't want to spoil the ending for you guys, but... Um, really cool story. I really liked it. Dogfight. And then the final story, Burning Chrome story about uh, two guys in the sprawl series universe one guy's more focused on hardware the other one is more focused on software and they've been running uh, cyber attacks for for quite a while um, different um, different gigs um, it's called decking now on the sprawl series is very famous that you you see th there's ice which is like um, cybernetic protection and there's this like uh, representation of holographic entities that you can see represented on the holographic world and you need both a physical presence to defend your access to the console and you need uh, someone who is good inside uh, the machine and has special modules and stuff to do like the, the cyber hacking uh, itself it's called decking i think uh, so uh, this was the first story that apparently Gibson wrote, uh, where he went into that whole universe, where you have these uh, deckers for hire, um, and um, something interesting happens. Uh, they also have uh, a couple other characters that get involved, uh, which are also pretty interesting. Um, uh, I especially like how it was set in this future where you try, like, your destiny is to go to Shiba City, uh, which is this big prefecture in Japan that, uh, on the story timeline, is, like, the biggest place ever. It's, like, the Hollywood of, of uh, that time. Technologically superior to everything. Um, if you manage to go there, you'll make, a, you'll make something big of yourself. So uh, there's this whole uh, culture of uh, being in a small bar, doing this uh, whole set of different gigs, trying to scrawn for money, for you to get better hardware, for you to enhance your software hacking or ice breaking skills in this case, different programs that can do different stuff. And at the same time, the, this glamorous life that you just want to uh, look pretty and look high tech enough 
uh, with beautiful artificial eyes to be on the, the cover of, of uh, fancy magazines. And uh, I really like the dynamic between the, the, all of the characters and there's an interesting uh, twist at the end. Uh, they pull off this, uh, or they try to pull off this big heist. Um, and it has some interesting consequences. I'm not, not going to spoil the rest. Uh, I really liked how it set up the whole sprawl thing. Uh, not just the culture in terms of urban people, like... Uh, decadent little bars where those kind of people get together to trade secrets and to uh, trade uh, stuff and they have to use all their network contacts to you know find better software find better hardware and um, inspect uh, the the target that they're gonna to to attack later on and if you play uh, a lot of video games um not just uh, Neuromancer itself, but also uh, Cyberpunk, the OZX, stuff like that. You, you can see a lot of these uh, lore, character-defining elements that are very present there. Um, they really define the whole, the whole uh, Cyberpunk uh, genre in some way. So yeah, very excited to uh, start reading on the trilogy. I have a few other books that I want to slide in before I get uh, going on the rest of the Sprawl trilogy, but I was really happy by with reading Burning Chrome. I recommend it uh, to uh, people, especially if you are interested in uh, Cyberpunk uh, itself, or if you're marginally interested in Cyberpunk. Uh, if you're very interested in Cyberpunk, you definitely need to read it, because Gibson pretty much invented Cyberpunk, and this is like uh, some of his uh, best uh, standalone uh, stories before he got uh, big on writing the Sprawl series. Anyways, sorry the video took so long. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, see you next time. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think about uh, the Sprawl series. Uh, Cyberpunk in general, William Gibson, if you already knew him, if you didn't know him, all that kind of jazz. See you next video. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.